Before we start today's video, I would like to take a moment to thank the people who made telling today's story possible. I'd like to thank Lynn, a good friend of Marilyn Hinell, who we're discussing today. She helped provide photos and her recollection of events back when she knew Marilyn. I would also like to give a big thanks to Marilyn's daughter, Vanessa, who's also the sister of Lisa Marie Velasquez, who we're also discussing today. I want to thank her and her family for giving me blessing on releasing today's video, as well as providing information and photos. Marilyn and Lisa's stories are examples of how far things can go when a relationship becomes physical and how the effects of it can trickle down to family and friends. And a lot of times, innocent people are the ones who pay with their lives, even when they're trying to help. I have to warn that today's video has a lot of details in both stories that are going to be very difficult to make it through. So please, go on with caution. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Park in New York City. Two bags filled with body parts. Human body parts. A large crime scene right now outside Cortona Park in the Claremont section of the Bronx. Eyewitness News reporter Safan Kim is there live with what we know so far. Safan? Well, shout in, Bill. That is Cortona Park, and that's Clinton Playground inside it, where we saw all night kids playing basketball and riding scooters. On the other side of this fence is where those two bags are found, just outside this park. A mutilated victim found. Police still can't say the gender or age of the victim. Cops say a Parks Department employee found two bags on the sidewalk near Cortona Park South and Franklin Street, just outside Cortona Park. He called over his superior. At first, they thought it might have been a dead dog, but when they started to open the bags to check it out, they saw hair and called police. We have new information to bring you this morning about that disturbing discovery in the Bronx. We had the story yesterday morning. The NYPD has now released a sketch of the victim, who they believe was the victim, found Friday. A Parks Department employee discovered human remains in two bags in the Claremont section. Police are hoping someone might recognize uh, the sketch of this woman. Even as she was let out of the police precinct station house in handcuffs, Sierra Martinez insisted she cared for Lisa Marie Velasquez. She was my friend. I loved her. She's now charged with Velasquez's murder. 30-year-old Martinez and her 31-year-old boyfriend, Daquan Wheeler, were arrested Wednesday, both charged with murdering Velasquez and then hiding her remains. In 2006, when Velasquez was 12, she witnessed the murder of her own mother, who was nine months pregnant. Her family now left to deal with yet another devastating loss. The footage you just saw was taken from news broadcasts in the summer of 2018. The victim in question is Lisa Marie Velasquez, a driven young woman from the Bronx, New York, who had her life brutally taken as a bizarre story of betrayal began to unfold. The story will leave the entire city shocked and also leave many who knew her asking how something like this could ever happen to someone like her, someone who was known to be so loving and so kind-hearted. But during much of her short life, Lisa had a darkness looming over her and her loved ones because 12 years before her passing, her mother, Marilyn Hinell, met an eerily similar fate, with her life being brutally taken in an ultimate act of betrayal. And her daughter Lisa, along with her two other children, were there to witness it all as it took place right before their eyes. On today's episode of Evil Intentions, this is Fate of Two, the stories of Marilyn Hinell and Lisa Marie Velasquez. Bronx. Two bags with body parts inside had been discovered in a park in Hunts Point, and investigators believe they are linked to body parts discovered on Friday. Marilyn Hinell was born on March 13, 1969, and resided in the Bronx, New York. She
She came from a tight-knit family and was known to be very close to them. She attended PS29 across the street from where she resided, and while there, she would make many friends. Marilyn was described as a very friendly and outgoing person, someone with a happy and sometimes spontaneous personality. She had a big smile she was known for and always well-dressed, always taken care of. Growing up in the Bronx in the 70s and 80s wasn't the easiest, but the growing trends like fashion and different types of music served as pleasant distractions. During her time at PS29, Marilyn had a group of friends she would often hang out with and always spoke to, sometimes leading to the group of friends getting into lighthearted trouble because they loved talking to each other during class. Some of those talks were between her and her good friend Lynn. Lynn had only recently transferred from private school to public school and was having a hard time with the transition. Marilyn was one of her very first friends at the school, making it all a bit easier. They would become close in no time. The two of them were huge Menudo fans, Menudo being the hugely popular boy band from Puerto Rico. They would have friendly fights over the members of the group since those were some of their first crushes, like other children their age. Some of the activities they partake in included jumping rope and playing tag during recess. The simple things. Marilyn's mother and grandmother would often visit Marilyn and her friends at the school during their lunch break as the kids played in the yard. While there, they'd often pass Marilyn and her friend Lynn snacks, candy, and soda. They always shared what they had with one another. Marilyn's mother was said to have always been very caring and someone who kept a watchful eye over her daughter. Her love and care didn't stop at Marilyn, though. It was just in her nature, and she always extended that same care to Marilyn's friend. The young girls shared a lot of moments during their friendship, one of those being their prom at the end of elementary school, just one of Lynn's fond memories with Marilyn and friends. Their prom was held at a spot called Alex and Henry's Restaurant, not far from where they lived, just walking distance. The place was upscale and was often used for big events like wedding receptions. A red carpet greeted the young ladies and their friends. They'd spend their evening dancing the night away to some of their favorite disco artists and ordering sodas like they were cups of champagne. The evening gave the kids a step away from some of the dangers that lurked on a regular basis outside of the restaurant because the streets of the Bronx were starting to change. As the children grew older, they graduated from elementary school to junior high. They'd attend junior high school 162, Lola Rodriguez de Tio, on St. Anne's Avenue in the Bronx. Things were rapidly starting to change for young kids in the Bronx. Kids like Lynn and Marilyn, who were into artists like Donna Summers and the Bee Gees, coming out of the disco era, were now starting to see artists like Curtis Blow make it big, as the 80s entered and the sounds of hip-hop continued to take over the city. Aside from the music, Marilyn and some of her friends were into the latest coats with matching book bags and many other fashion trends. The girls would always ask their parents to get them the latest, and if it was financially possible, they had no problem giving the girls what they asked for. But life in junior high was a lot different from elementary school. Now, the kids were drinking, experimenting with drugs, and having intercourse at all ages. They stood away from the negative influences. Important to mention that these activities were all known to be happening in the school. It was a whole different world from what the kids were used to. Marilyn adjusted to her new surroundings, but Lynn would find her time at 162 to be more difficult and found it harder to navigate. So the two would remain friends, but they inevitably grew apart when Lynn switched schools. Over the years, as junior high ended and the young ladies made their way into high school, Lynn and Marilyn would often run into one another in the neighborhood. Other times, they'd link up and just go to the yard of PS29 when school wasn't in session so they could play handball. Either that or they'd ride bike around the area. At the time, on 3rd Avenue in the Bronx, there was a well-known fish market that Marilyn and Lynn's parents would shop at a place they'd been visiting for years. They would often bump into one another here and sometimes head into one of the mom and pop's record stores the area was known for, places they'd be able to get the latest music from artists like Hector Lavoe and El Gran Combo. As time went on, most of those mom and pop's businesses would shut down and Lynn would see Marilyn less frequently. The last time that Lynn ran into Marilyn on the streets of the Bronx was around the year 2000. They were happy to have run into each other. They always were. Marilyn was with her mother and her daughter running some errands in the neighborhood as usual, but what neither of them knew was that this interaction between the two would be the very last because new dangers in Marilyn's life would put her on a path that led to tragedy. At some point later, Marilyn would meet and begin dating a man by the name of Robert Coakley. She was now a mother to three young children from previous relationships. These were not children that she shared with Coakley. 
Marilyn always showed her children a lot of love, but according to documents, Coakley, on the other hand, was a whole different story. He was someone with a history of arrests that dated back to 1981. He'd been arrested for selling drugs and committing robberies. It's unclear how the two met or exactly how long they were together, but their relationship was said to have lasted a few years. And during that time, their relationship went through a series of very hard moments. The couple fought all the time, according to comments made by a next door neighbor. They'd often hear arguing and crying. It was said that the children feared Coakley. He was known to be vulgar and very mean to the children, sometimes saying that the kids could take care of themselves. When the oldest of the children, Lisa, was only 12, police had been called to Marilyn's home on different occasions for domestic disputes brought on by Coakley. In many of the heated arguments, things became physical, and the relationship was proving to be very harmful, not only for Marilyn, but her children. Part of the reason behind the fights was because apparently, Coakley was taking Marilyn's money, money she was given through public assistance to help raise her children. Friends of Marilyn stated that Coakley would show up at Marilyn's home at the beginning of the month when she would receive her check, just so he could take it from her. He also had no problem taking the money by knocking on neighbors' doors asking for food. It was clear that there were some serious issues between the two, and they would eventually get much worse. Coakley was a married man, but had been separated from his wife for a while when he and Marilyn began dating, at least to Marilyn's knowledge, which leads us to March of 2006. By this time, Marilyn, now 36 years old, was pregnant with Coakley's child. According to reports, Marilyn wanted to marry Coakley, despite the problems between them. She was nine months pregnant and close to giving birth to a baby girl someday very soon. When March of 2006 rolled around, Marilyn and Coakley had recently broken up. According to reports, he was living with Marilyn at the time, but he left the home when the relationship ended because Coakley got back with his wife. Once he went back to his wife, it was said that Marilyn cut off all access to bank accounts the two shared, as anyone would expect. But this would drive Coakley mad with rage, bringing us to March 30th of 2006. On this day, Marilyn's mother would stay at Marilyn's apartment with the kids while she went to an important appointment concerning her pregnancy and also went shopping. A few hours later, Marilyn returned to her apartment and she was with Coakley presumably because he was the father of the child and Marilyn had just seen doctors about the pregnancy. The kids were fine and their mother was now back home, so Marilyn's mother left. She had no idea that this would be the last time she would ever see her daughter alive. Coakley and Marilyn got into a big argument that was said to revolve around the PIN number to one of Marilyn's public assistance cards. Like other fights the couple had, this had become a volatile interaction one that was quickly unfolding as all three of Marilyn's children looked on. It was during this argument that Maria Coakley, Coakley's wife, arrived at Marilyn's home. Confused as to why this woman was in her home, the fight became more intense. But with a few words, Coakley's motives would become very, very clear. He would go on to tell Marilyn that this was a setup. They wanted access to her cards for her money, and they weren't leaving without it. That wasn't the only reason for the setup. Coakley's wife held a huge amount of resentment and jealousy for Marilyn because she knew that the child inside of her that was soon to be born belonged to her husband. In a matter of minutes, the situation went from bad to much worse as Robert Coakley snatched Marilyn's phone out of her hands so she couldn't call anyone for help. Maria Coakley then slapped Marilyn with such a force that it knocked her to the ground, causing her to bleed. Coakley and his wife would then begin to savagely beat Marilyn both hitting her all over her body, mostly in her back, and slamming her head into the wall repeatedly. It was also said that the two tried to suffocate her with a pillow, but were unsuccessful. As the two beat her, Marilyn struggled and tried to defend herself, but they would both quickly overpower her. The children were then forced into separate bedrooms, and Coakley dragged Marilyn into her room as he beat her. As the children peeked out of their rooms, Marilyn's eldest daughter, Lisa, would see the entire struggle and would witness some of her mother's final moments. Marilyn would scream her last words to her children, saying, I'll always love you. Take care, as if she knew she wouldn't make it out of this alive. Seconds later, Maria Coakley would follow her husband into the room and shut the door behind her. The children heard the sounds of struggles and screams as the couple did the unthinkable to their mother. 
Maria Coakley would help beat and pin Marilyn to the bed so that her husband could easily carry out the rest of his attack. After asking where the money was and not getting the answer he wanted, the entire ordeal would become even darker when Coakley took a butcher knife and sliced Marilyn's throat open, followed by more attacks as he repeatedly stabbed her in the neck and head. He then hit her in the head over and over, eventually cracking her skull open. It was clear that the attack was very personal and fueled by rage, and the children heard it all. They stated they heard a loud noise, followed by another loud noise, and then silence. The next thing Lisa heard was the Coakleys laughing at her mother, laughing at the horrific act that they had just committed, as if they were proud of taking Marilyn's life, along with the life growing inside of her. They had taken Marilyn's life in cold blood in just a matter of minutes. The children were terrified and didn't know what to make of what just took place. Marilyn's son heard the last of his mother's screams and came out of the room, only to find the Coakleys leaving the bedroom on their way to the bathroom to wash blood from the knife. Once they were done, Coakley would approach the children in the home and told them that if they told anyone what they had witnessed, he would take all three of their lives next. He would hold the butcher knife to the ear of Marilyn's young son, threatening to cut it off if he told anyone. Coakley would turn his attention to Lisa, asking her where the money in the home was. She was hesitant to tell him, and Coakley didn't like her response, calling her a bitch and continuing to threaten them. Coakley would then tell the children that he was going to get food, maybe to make them think that he would return. The couple would then leave the apartment, closing the door behind them. The couple would then leave the apartment, slamming the door behind them. Lisa and her brother knocked on their mother's bedroom door a few times, hoping for some sort of response but she didn't answer. They would enter the bedroom to find their mother's lifeless body lying on the mattress, and the room was covered in blood. The scene was so bad that very early reports even stated that Marilyn had been shot, but that was soon omitted from later reports. Marilyn's son would tell reporters the following, I knocked on her door two times and she didn't answer, and I went in and she was dead. I went in my room and cried. Now she's in heaven. Lisa would tell reporters she and her brother saw their mother's body, but they didn't want their younger sister to see what they saw. As if this wasn't already the worst situation imaginable, it turns out Robert Coakley had added insult to injury when he stole money from 12-year-old Lisa. He took $35 in allowance money she had saved. She stated that she had been saving the funds to help get food and clothes for her unborn baby sister and because she wanted to buy her baby sister a crib. The innocence in her words and the way the children spoke left their grandmother brokenhearted. A woman who was not only grieving the loss of her beloved daughter, but had to be strong for her other children and her grandchildren. The news would catch everyone off guard since nobody expected for things to take such a tragic turn. Marilyn's mother would tell reporters that she thanked God her grandchildren weren't harmed. The fear in the family after this happened was still very fresh and a big part of it was because Robert and Maria Coakley were still somewhere out there, considered very dangerous and capable of anything. Detectives would ask the public for help in finding the murderous couple, putting their pictures in local papers to help with the search. While on the run, Coakley would use the card he took from Marilyn and gained access to $1,200 she had in the account, and he withdrew at least $400. It looked like they had no plans on ever being found. But surprisingly, on April 3rd of 2006, after four days on the run, Robert and Maria Coakley would turn themselves in. They went to the 43rd precinct and told officers what they had done. The two were taken into custody on the spot. On April 4th of 2006, a service was held for Marilyn Hinell at the Eternity Funeral Home on East Gun Hill Road. Hundreds of people paid their respects and visited Marilyn's open casket. She wore a white dress and laid out right beside her was her unborn daughter. The child had wavy hair and wore a bonnet as she lied next to her mother. This was requested by Lisa and her siblings because this would be the first and last time that they would ever get to see their mother hold their baby sister. Cries of grief could be heard throughout the funeral home. Lisa would cry out, I love you, mommy. I want you to come back. It was a heartbreaking truth the children had to face, a life without their mother. But this very dark moment in Lisa's life, seeing her mother in that coffin, gave her a sense of strength. It made her want to testify against Coakley to get justice for her mother. 
Lisa, being the oldest, immediately stood up to be there for her siblings and her family, even at just 12 years old. A lot of kids in that position wouldn't know how to navigate the immense grief that comes with losing your mother, but she held her head high, as did her siblings. In this photo, captured on the day of Marilyn's wake, you see Lisa and her two siblings as they stand in front of their mother and sister's coffin, trying their best to be positive and smile through this awful tragedy. They all donned shirts that had Marilyn's name with her date of birth and the letters RIP across the chest. It's a very sad photo to look at, knowing that these kids were trying their best to cope and that this was their new reality. But this photo would speak volumes over a decade later when Lisa would suffer an eerily similar fate to that of her mother and nobody ever saw it coming. A tragedy like this is all too familiar. In 2006, Velasquez's mother, Marilyn Janelle, was found murdered inside the Bronxdale houses. She'd been stabbed and was pregnant at the time. Her boyfriend was later found guilty. Lisa Marie Velasquez was born on June 5, 1993, and also resided in the Bronx, New York. After the horrific events she witnessed in 2006, Lisa's grandmother would gain custody of Lisa and her siblings. The tragedy involving Marilyn took its toll on the entire family, and it was something they never truly got over. Still, everyone tried to put their best foot forward, supporting one another through it all. Lisa's aunt would say that after Marilyn's passing, Lisa wanted to be more helpful and a strong support system for her family, and that's exactly what she was. She was also described as someone full of life who always stood focused, known for her pleasant smile and positive attitude. As she grew into her teen years during high school, Lisa was a part of the ROTC Explorers program for NYPD, a program designed to introduce kids in the inner city to law enforcement. Lisa was focused and intelligent, so the program was a perfect fit, and she would later become an auxiliary officer. Nothing meant more to Lisa than her family and her future, so she was setting herself up for success. She was determined to make the most of herself. At a young age, she had already experienced more than most adults twice her age, but she learned to work through those feelings and those hard times, and she stood the course. As she got older, some of Lisa's interests included playing softball every Saturday with the Bronx Rebellions. She donned the number 42 jersey. The team members on the Rebellions were some of the people she was closest to. She loved playing for the team so much that she often proudly wore the jersey and matching hat of her team, even when she wasn't playing. Over the years, Lisa had lived in a number of places, at some points leaving New York City before coming back to the Melrose section of the Bronx, where she would reside with her grandmother. She was trying different things to see what felt best for her. Being a hard worker, Lisa held a number of jobs, from her auxiliary job mentioned earlier, to at one point working for Disney Cruise Lines, and later on, working at a local Modell sporting goods store in the Bronx. It was here that she would befriend a co-worker by the name of Sierra Martinez, 30 years old. While working together, They'd quickly become friends, and over time, became closer and closer. They'd become so close that Sierra began to share certain parts of her life with Lisa that not many knew at the time, like the fact that she was currently in an abusive relationship. Her boyfriend, 31-year-old Daquan Wheeler, was someone with a history of arrests. He had served time for attempted murder in 2008 and also had charges for attempted robbery in Brooklyn not long after. Martinez was no stranger to the court system either since she too had run-ins with the law. In 2010, she committed a robbery in Queens, and for the crime, she did almost four years behind bars. Martinez lived in a two-story home located on Longfellow Ave in the Bronx. She lived there with Wheeler and a small child that was said to be their daughter. They only lived there for about three months, but in that short time, neighbors witnessed a lot, and it was clear that there were major issues between the two. It was said that they fought all the time, they could be heard screaming at each other most days. Neighbors also stated that Martinez and Wheeler had previously lived in a homeless shelter before relocating to Longfellow Ave. Martinez worked during the daytime, and Wheeler was said to be working in building maintenance, working night shifts. Another dead giveaway that this relationship was getting volatile was that Martinez could often be seen with bruises on her arms, indicating that some of those fights between her and Wheeler had turned physical. At an earlier date, neighbors even reported seeing Wheeler break into the home through a window, followed by a woman's screams as she yelled that he was going to kill her. Clearly, the relationship had reached a dangerous point, 
All of these details about Sierra's life might sound very similar to what Marilyn and other women experience in an abusive relationship. Lisa noticed that too, and being that her mother was in a similar relationship before her life was taken, she had a special place in her heart for Sierra. She wanted to be a support system for her and always offered her help, telling Sierra that if she ever needed her for anything at all, she was just a phone call away. On August 8th of 2018, a number of calls were made to 911 for domestic disputes at the Longfellow Ave home where Martinez and Wheeler resided. It was becoming a normal occurrence at the home, but nothing compared to what would unfold on the evening of August 21st, 2018. On that evening, Lisa received a message from Sierra, whom she now considered her best friend. Sierra was clearly upset and she explained that Wheeler had not only been attacking her again, but this time he left the home and took their daughter with him. Lisa had seen this type of situation unfold before and became very overprotective and very much bothered at the entire situation. She thought of her friend's well-being and that of her young child. When the notification on Lisa's phone went off, she was visiting some of her family. Her first reaction was to grab her bag and leave as soon as possible to go be there for her friend. She left in a rush, barely explaining what was happening. All her family knew was that her friend was in trouble and she needed to get to wherever she was fast. Lisa would arrive at Sierra's home on Longfellow Ave shortly after. When she got there, she found Sierra by herself, covered in bruises and distraught. It was around two in the morning when Lisa would make a call to 911 and let them know she was reporting a kidnapping since after the beating, Wheeler took the child out of the home and nobody knew where he was. But not long after, Wheeler would return to the home and he would learn about the phone call Lisa made to authorities. He would then explode into a rage. He would grab a hammer and he struck Lisa in her head with one massive blow, causing her to fall to the ground. According to court documents, Martinez suggested that they call 911 to get medical attention for Lisa, but Wheeler had other plans. He would get on top of Lisa, pinning her down, and continued to deliver the savage attack, hitting her in the head with that hammer a total of 14 times. As Lisa stood there, bleeding out, clinging to life, Wheeler wasn't done. He would then take an electrical cord and wrapped it around Lisa's neck, pulling as hard as he could, strangling her. He would then look at Sierra and told her that she was going to help with what came next. He would take Lisa's battered and lifeless body and drag her into the bathroom, placing her in the bathtub. The duo would then clean the bedroom and bathroom, using towels to soak up the blood and tossing those too, also getting rid of their clothes and Lisa's clothes in an attempt to cover up the scene. They then left the home and visited a hardware store nearby where they bought trash bags and got a hold of a large machete. When they returned to the home, both Martinez and Wheeler would begin to chop Lisa's body into pieces, removing her arms, her legs, and her head. Her remains were then tossed into trash bags to be discarded as if she was nothing. They then cleaned some more and painted several of the walls in the home to make it seem like nothing happened there. The end result of a kind person with a big heart trying to help a friend. Lisa's family quickly noticed that she hadn't been in contact with anyone and hadn't been heard from since that night that Sierra contacted her. Lisa's aunt would contact Sierra because she wanted to know if she had any information on Lisa's whereabouts. But the more she called, the more her calls went unanswered. The fear and uncertainty would begin to creep into the minds of Lisa's family, who were beginning to think the worst. Another aunt who lived in the same building as Lisa would report her missing the very next day. Loved ones came together to form search parties and post flyers of Lisa, searching everywhere they could for her. On August 24th, two very long days after her life was taken, a city parks worker was walking by the entrance to Cretona Park when he noticed two bags on the ground. When he looked to see what was inside, he would be horrified to find the inside of the bag covered in blood and a head and torso were inside. He would contact authorities right away. On August 25th, after the first set of remains were found near Cretona Park, detectives working the case quickly released a sketch of who the victim may be. At this point, Lisa was still just missing, but as the days went on, another awful discovery was made. On August 28th, a few days later, human remains were found under a pier at Barreto Point Park in the Hunts Point section of the Bronx. Plastic bags were found by some people who'd been visiting the park, and inside of those bags were arms and feet. 
With that sketch being released days earlier, calls began coming into the Crime Stoppers hotline. A total of 10 people called the hotline, with one of them mentioning that the remains found could belong to Lisa due to the resemblance in the sketch. This information, paired with the fact that more remains were found just two miles from where the first discovery was made, would make it easier for authorities to connect the dots. They soon confirmed that the remains scattered throughout the Bronx were those of Lisa Marie Velasquez, but they still had no idea who would ever do this to her. Family and friends were absolutely broken. They couldn't think of anyone who would want to do this to her, a woman who had no enemies. This would lead authorities to scrupulously searching through phone records now that they had Lisa's name. They would find evidence of the phone calls she made from Martinez's home. They soon visited the location to have a word with Martinez and Wheeler to see what they knew. The couple wasn't home. As they looked through the windows, they noticed that the apartment was a little too clean and was obviously painted recently. There were also cleaning products laying around, raising their suspicions. After obtaining a search warrant, they would look for any evidence possible in the home. That's when they'd come to the conclusion that Lisa was dismembered inside of the bathtub. The authorities continued to work quickly, and on Wednesday, August 29th of 2018, Daquan Wheeler and Sierra Martinez were found and arrested for the heinous act committed against Lisa. They faced a slew of charges that included murder, manslaughter, tampering with evidence, criminal possession of a weapon, and concealment of a human corpse. As the news made its way around, loved ones were distraught and trying to make sense of it all. On one hand, they were relieved at the progress and how quickly the two murderers were brought to justice. But the truth was, it would do very little to eliminate the anger, the pain, or the anguish that they felt inside. All this family wanted was for their beloved Lisa to return home, unharmed. Instead, they would have to adjust to life without her, and it wouldn't get any easier anytime soon. A mutilated victim found. Police still can't say the gender or age of the victim. Cops say a Parks Department employee found two bags on the sidewalk near Crotona Park South and Franklin Street, just outside Crotona Park. He called over his superior. At first, they thought it might have been a dead dog, but when they started to open the bags to check it out, they saw hair and called police. <laughs> NYPD canines tonight are combing for clues. This morning, this neighbor says his dogs knew something was wrong. My dogs um, went towards the bags, and one of the parks people told me to don't let the bag, uh, don't let the dogs go near there because it smells. She didn't tell me nothing. She just told me that it smells to get away from there. Meanwhile, several neighbors here say they avoided parking next to those bags last night because the smell was sickening. My dogs, they, they went straight to it, both of them. And I have two little chihuahuas, and for them to smell it, it's like, there wasn't no blood, huh? There was the powerful smell. Now, the medical examiner will determine the cause of death. No ID yet on the victim. Earlier today, police remained at the scene of the Tiffany Street Pier in Hunts Point. That's where police found two garbage bags Tuesday night that contained human remains. One bag with a left arm and leg, the other with a right arm and leg. Police believe the bags washed up along the shore near Barreto Point Park and were discovered Tuesday evening by a small child who then told his mother about the grisly find. That discovery last night came just four days after other human remains, including a head, were found in two bags in Cortona Park, which is only about two to three miles from the other crime scene. We have learned today that authorities do believe both sets of remains are from the same woman. On Saturday, the NYPD released a sketch of that woman, described as a light-skinned Hispanic female between 20 and 30 years old, about five feet tall and 175 pounds. Authorities believe the woman died from blunt force trauma. Detectives are now looking at missing persons cases from the area in hopes of making a definitive identification of this victim. So far, there have been no arrests in the case. And again, we are back here live now in the 1000 block of Longfellow Avenue in the Bronx. As you can see, a very active scene here. We have the mobile command center here for the NYPD, a crime scene unit, also some lights attached to the back of that command center, meaning police do, I would assume, expect to be here quite some time. That again is because we're learning about the connection between those body parts and this residence. Police are not identifying the woman, but they do believe she came to this address here in the Bronx before she went missing. And right now they're behind me executing a search warrant, a major development in this grim and bizarre case.
Police have just announced the arrest of 31-year-old Daquan Wheeler and 30-year-old Sierra Martinez. We expect to see both of them led out of the 42nd Precinct in handcuffs within the next half hour. Police sources tell us the murder weapon in this case was a hammer. Only Wheeler has been charged with murder, but both are charged with concealment of a human corpse. An emotional embrace after... Perez learns her niece, 25-year-old Lisa Marie Velasquez, was found murdered and dismembered in the Bronx. She didn't deserve to die the way she did. The medical examiner says Velasquez died of multiple blunt force impact injuries to her head that fractured her skull. But it's where and how her body was discovered that is most disturbing. The way she was tortured, like for Christ's sakes. Police say part of Velasquez's body was found inside garbage bags near Cortona Park on August 24th. The rest of her remains were discovered August 28th at Barreto Point Park. Her family says they last saw her on August 21st at her home at the Melrose Houses and reported her missing and even put together this flyer with her picture on it. The last thing my mother remembers is her coming, grabbing her bag and being in a rush saying that she had to go help a friend that was in danger and she ran out of the house. On Wednesday, police focused their attention on this home on Longfellow Avenue and appeared to be removing evidence in brown paper bags. Sources say it is connected to the investigation, but it's still unclear how. For the family, a tragedy like this is all too familiar. In 2006, Velasquez's mother, Marilyn Janelle, was found murdered inside the Bronxdale houses. She'd been stabbed and was pregnant at the time. Her boyfriend was later found guilty. My sister was tortured while she was nine months pregnant in front of her three kids. Velasquez was one of those three children. Police have not said exactly what they found at that house on Longfellow Avenue where they spent the day collecting evidence, but that is the address given for both of the suspects in this case. Daquan, why'd you kill Lisa? What do you have to say? What do you have to say about the charges? Did you beat her with a hammer? Why did you beat her with a hammer? She was my friend. I love her. Sierra Martinez telling reporters Lisa Marie Velasquez was her friend. She's now accused in her murder. 30-year-old Martinez and her boyfriend, 31-year-old Daquan Wheeler, arrested Wednesday, are both charged with murdering Velasquez and hiding her remains. 25-year-old Velasquez died from multiple blunt force impact injuries to her head. Police sources say a hammer was used to fracture her skull. Her body was found inside garbage bags near Cortona Park last Friday, and the rest of her remains were discovered Tuesday in Barreto Point Park. Heartbreak in Melrose. We don't expect it this close to home. This, the second time a horrific tragedy has struck this family. Velasquez's mother was murdered 12 years ago. It's been hard, and it's going to get worse. As time goes along, my mother hasn't got over my, my sister. Daquan Wheeler and Velasquez's close friend, Sierra Martinez, were officially charged in the murder Thursday evening. That was a domestic dispute that the victim of the homicide was not involved in. She's reporting a domestic incident regarding essentially her friend. Outside the Melrose houses where Velasquez lived with her grandmother and two younger siblings, stunned and crying faces packed a solemn vigil in her memory. She's the nicest person. She cares for her grandmother, she cares for her siblings, she cares for all of us. Both Wheeler and Martinez have a criminal past, which includes robbery. Wheeler is on parole for a previous attempted murder case. The couple had a child together, which is now in protective custody. Yeah. Anybody who attempted murder should not be in the streets, because when they're attempting, they're going to do it. The family says they want to remember Velasquez by her smile and love for softball, not the gruesome way she died. After attending the arraignment, they called for both Wheeler and the friend she rushed to help to face equal punishment. She's got to be charged just as well, and maybe more. Wheeler and Martinez are due back in court next Tuesday. The funeral will be after Labor Day at the Ortiz Funeral Home on East 149th Street here in the Bronx. Daquan Wheeler was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison for the death of Lisa Marie Velasquez. Family and friends were more than vocal about the sentencing from the very beginning, stating that both Wheeler and Martinez needed to be punished and serve the same sentences. Neither one of these monsters was innocent or even close, and the guilt was theirs both. But instead, Martinez was given time served because she struck a deal and cooperated with authorities, testifying against Wheeler. She was given just a misdemeanor charge of conspiracy in the fifth degree. 
Here, we see Martinez speaking with reporters as she leaves the courthouse, a free woman. I'm just glad justice is served. This is all behind me. This is all behind the families. Um, just want to move on with it. Uh, I was cleared. Um, I will no longer be coming to court anymore. And uh, that hopefully my name will also get cleared from the discredit that I had in this. Just thank you. A service for Lisa Marie Velasquez was held on September 6, 2018, at a funeral home in the Bronx. Many would come to pay their respects and offer their condolences and say their final goodbyes to Lisa. The moment was surreal as families still try their best to cope with this tragedy. The support from all those around them would make things a little bit easier. The events that took place in March of 2006 with Marilyn Hinell and in August of 2018 with her daughter Lisa speak volumes of the dangers of domestic violence and just how quickly things can take a turn for the worst. Marilyn, a woman who only saw the best in someone and wanted to spend her life with them when she was faced with an ultimate act of betrayal. Her daughter, Lisa, who had a heart of gold and only wanted to help. Memories of her mother's tragic end gave her the courage to face domestic violence head on, even if it wasn't her experiencing the abuse. She wanted to be someone helpful someone others could rely upon. She too faced an ultimate act of betrayal when the person she cared for so much and rushed to help would be the very same person getting rid of her remains and trying to cover it up. We've spoken about moments when a child witnesses the unthinkable and grows up with the traumatic moment replaying in their heads. For example, the story of Anita Stewart when an eight-year-old Richard Timmons Jr. witnessed his father brutally take the lives of Anita and his two siblings he would go on to be just as much of a monster as his father was, committing an equally heinous act on his wife many years later, after subjecting her to years and years of severe abuse, just like his father did to Anita. But here, we have the exact opposite. Lisa witnessed the worst thing imaginable along with her siblings, when her mother's life was brutally taken, pretty much right before their eyes. But they'd grow up with good hearts, good intentions, and cared for one another deeply never forgetting what had taken place that night in 2006, sticking by each other every step of the way until 2018, when they'd be forced to go through it all again. Whether it be in the 90s, 2006, or 2018, even if the details in all of these stories differ in many ways, still, somehow, the end result is always the same. Tragedy strikes, and the people who did it are still here. While these innocent men, women, and children aren't, and it's the loved ones of these victims that are left picking up all the pieces. Rest in peace to Marilyn Hinell, her unborn child, and her daughter, Lisa Marie Velasquez, and my deepest condolences go out to her family and her loved ones. You aren't forgotten. <laughs>